Okay, good afternoon everyone. So I think my go signal na tayo na start. So I'm going to start off this um, PCA colloquium, which is the last bunch of uh, PCA talks for this year for AAA. Um, so I'm going to talk about a paper that was published um, actually online um, by as early as March this year, but on paper um, last June. And this is entitled A Quasi Concertina Force Displacement Men's Probe for Measuring Biomechanical Properties. So, just to give a brief background, this is not part of my PhD dissertation. So, I got involved in this project by accident. So, then, you know, by accident, but accidentally lang because um, as I was working in the clean room during my PhD, David was also a PhD student and he was consulting with the second author, Antulio, about um, uh, his device, fabricating his device. And around the same time that he was consulting with Antulio, I was also working with Antulio for my PhD. And Antulio told David that actually Tess has been doing a lot of work on this and maybe she can help me with that. So that's why I got involved in the research. Um, and also, um, Harold Chong, which is his PhD advisor, is also my um, second advisor. So that was a natural um, collaboration for us as well. So to start off with my talk, um, I will first give an introduction about um, what we want to achieve with this um, study. And then I'll briefly discuss the design of the device and then fabrication, which is what most of my contribution would be on this paper, fabrication and a little bit on the testing part and also the conclusion of the study. So spring in MEMS devices, um, such as accelerometers, gyroscopes, optical mirrors, and biosensors, um, they, these are critical components um, that affects the accuracy, um, linearity, and operation range of these devices. Now, there are basic spring types that are shown here. Okay? These are the common types that we see um, in uh, literature. So we have the cantilever type, um, the double clamp beam, wherein you, uh, in the cantilever type, only one side of the beam is um, fixed. Whereas in the double clamp beam, two sides are fixed. And then we also have the crab leg where in four corners are fixed. And then the folded spring here wherein you have us, the fixed parts are actually these four parts here. And then you have the suspended structure in the middle and the spring is this uh, uh, beam, folded beam here okay, on both sides. Now this spring, types um, have limited linearity and travel range. So when we say linearity, um, how linear the, the displacement of the spring is with respect to the force that is applied to it. So um, there are certain applications wherein you would want to have a larger range okay, of displacement or force where the device would still have linear characteristics. And um, most researchers work on improving the travel range and the linearity by using um, this type of structure, so in serpentine structure. So this improves linearity and travel range in the in-plane direction, so in the same plane as the um, device. Now, if you want to improve on the linearity or if you want to have okay, a, a spring where, where in the compliance, the movement is greater in the out-of-plane direction, then an option would be the spring-supported diaphragm here, wherein the, the middle diaphragm, the membrane in the middle, is the one that, that moves no, in the uh, perpendicular direction to the spring. So the springs are distributed on the corners of the diaphragm. However, in this spring-supported diaphragm, um, it only supports small deflections no, in the out-of-plane 
uh, direction. So when we, when, what we want to do, okay, what we want to develop is a device wherein there would be greater reflection in the out of plane um, direction. So the um, inspiration for the device is the concertina. The concertina is a musical instrument, okay, so something like a, a an accordion wherein okay, the, the instrument can um, stretch and uh, compress, okay, so depending on the way that it is played. So um, with this, then we started so looking at, okay, can we design something similar wherein you have, instead of just okay, springs on the corners of the diaphragm, we have series of beams around the suspended structure. So here's the final design of the device. So it's a quasi concertina spring. So you can see here that um, the beams, the series of beams is actually um, placed okay, around the suspended structure, which is this part here. And um, initial finite element analysis simulations so show that it is possible okay, to achieve larger deflection in the out of plane direction okay, using this type of structure. Now, um, to be able to determine okay, the sizes of the devices that we will fabricate, then that means, because okay, it's very tedious to do the the SEA simulation, it takes a long time. So we have to model the device. So to model the device, we just modeled it such that, okay, considering that if you have a series of beams here, okay, and we apply a force F in the Z direction, then you could just cut or look at just one side of the structure and implement or analyze that as a series of beams with a quarter of the force applied to it, and then those series of beams can be lumped together to as a single beam so that essentially the analysis part, if you just want to model this device, could be done just by using the equations for a double clamp beam. Okay, but considering these cases here. Now the um, what the reasons for the design for designing it this way is that first. Uh, the, num the use of a series of number of beams um, increases the displacement range and linearity of the device. Secondly, we make sure that the thickness of the beam is much smaller than the length and the width of the beam. And this makes sure that um, the deflection is largest when it's applied, the force is applied at the perpendicular direction. And thirdly, um, we also note that the length of the beam okay, should be designed such that um, any tension or compression that happens along the beam, okay, the effect of that should be much smaller than the actual bending of the beam. Okay, para lang yung analysis, kumbaga yung may limit dun sa sizing ng device are these considerations. No? We have to make sure that we eliminate the effects of yung tension and compression sa beam as well as when the thickness of the beam is um, very small no? para hindi masyadong ma-affect. So it's easier to model it and to predict the outcome okay, of the device once it is fabricated. In addition, okay, the design also uh, include self-sensing no, in the spring. So, simple lang yung ginamit na self-sensing na mechanism. I think you're all familiar with the Whitstone bridge here. So, um, piso resistors were just incorporated in the design so that any changes, um, so that um, the force, uh, any changes in the displacement can be measured by the, the, uh, tracking the changes in the resistances of these piezo key, key resistors. Um, so if you know, if you look at the equation here, which relates the output voltage to the bridge voltage, okay, 
um, we maximize the output voltage by keeping R1 and R3 in tension. So you notice here that the red parts there, those are the piezo resistors, um, representing R1 and R3. Because if you look at the beam, the double clamp beam, okay, tension would be occurring on this side of the beam and compression would be on this side. So that's why R2 and R4 okay, preferred to be in the compression state so that we maximize new output voltage so that the sensitivity of the measurement will be better. So we have the yellow piezo resistors here. That's representing R2 and R4. Now, each resistor is um, was cut into two segments. So let's say R1 would be this segment here and this segment here. So that if there's any misalignment during lithography or during the fabrication process, uh, equal yung change na mangyayari dun sa resistance. So, hindi man kasi important what the actual value of R1 and R3 is. It's imp what's important is that they are equal in value. So that's why okay, it was laid out in this way. And also, the sensitivity, so, okay, so if this is the relationship of the output voltage to the pH voltage, the resistances would depend on first, the piezo resistive coefficient, which is represented by pi here, and the stress of the beam, which is represented by sigma. So the sensitivity of these piezo resistors could be determined, it could be, actually, it could be in the derivation, but the derivation is that it could be determined from the material characteristics, which is the piezo resistive coefficient and the stress, and also the bridge voltage, which is the applied voltage to the spring. And the sensitivity tells us now the how much voltage we get at the output per unit of force that is applied on the device. Okay, so that this this relationship was used to determine the resolution of the device later on during testing. For the fabrication, so we start with a, uh, the with wafer preparation. So we start with a silicon on insulator wafer. So this is actually a silicon handle layer, then there's a buried oxide layer in between, and then we have a silicon device layer on top. And then from this SOI wafer, we, de we deposit a silicon dioxide um, layer, and this silicon di dioxide layer serves as the electrical insulator between the beam and the piezo res resistors. Okay, so yung beam will be fabricated on the device layer here, and then the piezo resistors would be this polysilicon layer which is deposited on top of the silicon dioxide. Okay, so most of my contribution in this work is determining the recipe for this polysilicon layer so that it would have the, the required characteristics for this device. Okay, so we started depositing amorphous silicon first and then we annealed it to make it polycrystalline. So medyo matagal yung process in that. After that, uh, we do backside semi-release. So we first coat the front side with silicon nitride and photoresist. So this is just to protect the front side of the wafer before doing any processes for the backside. Okay, silicon nitride because the uh, the etching of the backside is going to be through wet etching using potassium hydroxide. And potassium hydroxide etches silicon much, much faster than silicon nitride. So it's sort of a natural um, mask you know, for the silicon. But still, we put a photoresist just to make sure that the silicon nitride is not going to be depleted okay, before you finish processing the back. So at the back side, we also have silicon nitride and then photoresist, the red one, and that's patterned. Once the photoresist is patterned, then we etch out the silicon nitride and the silicon device, uh, silicon handle layer at the back side. So we just etch it using wet etching, um, leaving about 100 micron of the handle layer. So estimate. So why do we leave 100 micron? So that when we process on the front side, the structure is not going to be brittle. Okay? Because if anything 
um, thinner than 100 micron, there's a possibility that while you're etching on the front, okay, the beams would buckle. Okay, so after seven releasing the backside, then we do the uh, definition of the suspended structure. So this is uh, patterning the device layer of the SOI wafer. So we first um, deposit photoresist and then pattern it. And then we etch the polysilicon, the silicon dioxide, and then the silicon device layer under it. So the yellow part that you see here, that's the buried oxide layer of the SOI wafer. After this, we define the piezo resistor. So this time, we need to pattern the polysilicon layer. So we start with, again, depositing photoresist and then patterning it and then etching out the polysilicon. Okay, so the yellow part that you see here, that's the silicon dioxide that was deposited on top of the silicon device layer. And then after that, that's when we do metallization for the electrical contact. So uh, what we did here is we deposited um, aluminum. So aluminum was used as the electrical connector. And then we patterned it and then etched um, in wet etch. No? So wet etching of aluminum using an aluminum etchant. So here now we have patterned the electrical contacts. So this um, defines the... Uh, connections between the piezo resistors okay, to, the, to achieve the Wheatstone bridge configuration. Okay, so that's what we have here. And then finally, we now fully release the structure. So because this was just a prototype and we did the, the method that we use is we diced the whole wafer first so that the release of the sensor is done per chip. Okay, so para lang mas mataas yung possibility of success. So each chip okay, was um, processed. Okay, so now we have at the back side, we have a bit of silicon handle layer. So that's first etched um, using plasma etching. And then you see here that there's the silicon buried oxide, silicon dioxide buried layer here. So that's again plasma etched. And then at the front, we also plasma etch the remaining silicon dioxide. Okay, so and finally, we have the final device. So I have here some um, SEM figures or, of the device. So you see that here is the front side of the device. Here is the back side. Here you can see the piezo resistors okay, on the corners. And this is the device. Uh, wire bonded no, for, for testing later on. So you'll notice the the membrane in the middle actually have holes. So th this is not part of the design. It was just initially um, placed there because we, we were exploring a different type of fabrication method to release the sensor. So we were initially looking at wet um, etching of the silicon dioxide or vapor phase etching, but it turned out that it um, introduced a lot of stiction on the device, so so that uh, process was um, disregarded, but we still use the same mask. But effectively, if we use this fabrication process, we don't need the holes in the middle. Now for testing, um, this is just one of the tests that was done no? because of the time uh, constraints. I did not include the electrical tests anymore. Kasi pan, uh, it's just connecting the device in a series of instrumentation amplifiers and measuring noise to get the resolution because the resolution is determined from okay, the highest noise level no? in the noise spectral density. But what we have here is to, just to get the force versus displacement. So this was one of the setups that was made. So a vernier head is like a precision knob. Okay, so you will see there are gradations there. So you will see that every turn, how much the wire, the piano wire, um, displaces the device under test, which is the, the, the spring. And then the precision balance here would measure the change in mass. Okay, so we now relate the force to the mass using mass times acceleration. 
So here is a nice um, SEM of the device with the probe in the middle showing how it stretches. Um, Medyo may tilt because the probe was not really look, uh, placed in the center of the beam. So it's just for imaging purposes. Okay. Um, so just to give you uh, some results. So the FD jig, which is the pink one in the slide here, that was the actual test done. And we could see that um, the numerical, meaning the model that was used with the dub double clamp beam, um, has a good agreement with the actual measurements that we got. And you could also that it's fairly linear. You can see that it's fairly linear up to about a millimeter displacement okay, in the screen. Now to compare this with other work, um, commonly what's used in um, probing uh, biomechanical properties, the most common one would be the atomic force microscope. So that's the AFM. It has a very small resolution in the piconewton range and a wide range. So if you notice, one piconewton compared to one micron, ang laki ng range na yun. But the downside with using an AFM is that the way it works is you need to use several cantilevers to achieve the range required. So hindi pwedeng continuous yung measurement, you need to change the cantilevers used in the AFM. Okay, if you want to extend the range. And then there are two works here. And then you could see that this work, this particular work, could have a resolution of, um, force resolution of 5.6 nanonewton and a distance resolution of 1.25 nanometer. And the range would be 5.5 millinewton and the distance would be one millimeter. So in terms of using this in, in measuring biomechanical properties, pasok naman yung, um, yung specs niya. So you would have, um, for example, an artery which is 10 millimeter long with a diameter of 10 millimeter would have forces in the order of 0.5 micronewton to 5 micronewton. So it's within the range okay, that could be accommodated by this device. But of course, this is only the spring. No? So if we, we actually want to use this, then the probe must be um, integrated with the spring. Okay? So, it's this, so this is just sort of a proof of concept study. For, I'm not sure if David is still continuing this, because he's in Cambridge, so I'm not sure if he's doing the same work. Um, so in conclusion, we have um, discuss the design and the implementation of a highly linear and large displacement NEM sensor. And then this is suitable for measuring biomechanical properties that are in the nanonewton to nanometer resolution. And based on our model, similar devices with better resolution could be achieved by using the same structures. You just need, you just need to change the dimensions of the device. Okay, so that's it for my talk. I'd like to acknowledge these institutions for supporting this study. And I'm now open for questions. Okay, thanks. It's my unit, now it's another one. So good afternoon everyone and I'll be here to do my talk on designing wireless transceiver blocks for LoRa applications as part for the uh, uh, PCA awards, uh, PCA colloquium. 
Um, this work is primarily, uh, this talk is primarily based on. Oh, yeah. On the paper that we have presented in the IEEE 10 con, it's the work uh, with my students, a lot of them, and some colleagues in the lab. So, as a brief introduction, um, the main idea why we're pursuing this kind of research is to do or implement a multi radio uh, system on a chip, meaning in, in one chip, you have it supports different radio systems for short range and long-range communications, as well as having the needed elements for computing and sensing. So this single-chip SOC to be used uh, to have short-range and wireless, uh, short-range wireless and long-range wireless reach, and to be used primarily for sensor nodes for environmental monitoring, uh, especially uh, smart X or smart whatever applications and IoT or IoTX. So the main idea is that we should be focusing on the different parts of the SOC. Now for this uh, part of the, the project, we are focused on how do we implement this long-range radio to be used for this uh, multi-radio system SOC. So now I will just give a brief, very, very brief introduction of Internet of Things, the LoRa technology, some things that we have done and implemented using the 65 nanometer and some results and some conclusion. Now, with the idea is that with the Internet of Things, all of the things will be connected somewhere. How will they connect? By whatever means possible. Wireless, short range, mesh, long range, as long as it's connected somewhere, going to the cloud for analytics and handling of data. Now, for our case, our challenge is to really focus on one aspect of, like what I mentioned before, talking about how do you connect these things. Now, for this case, the, the problem was how do we build this uh, front end for a LoRa system. Now, we mentioned about LoRa. Now, what is LoRa? Essentially, it's a short for short acronym for uh, long range LoRa, but it's a proprietary IoT uh, wireless technology. Now, you may say, why, would we, why did we focus on a pro proprietary IoT technology? It's just, it's something that's there that was presented that could be used for IoT and it's very good to study this kind of implementation. Now for this case, uh, this long, long range uh, link, it's supposed to have a long range and a low power consumption. And it's supposed to be robust as it should be able to operate even if the GSM LTE exists in this kind of wireless environment. So now just to give a brief uh, background of the LoRa layers, at the bottom, we can see the full uh, LoRa physical layer, which includes the, the frequency bands that they use, the 800 megahertz, 400, and 915, and it's essentially an ISM band radio. So first part, bottom will be a generic ISM radio, but what makes this as a LoRa system is that they're using their proprietary uh, method for modulation, which is the LoRa modulation, which is based on a uh, CSS or without that <laughs> carrier sense uh, the chip, chirp spread spectrum technique. So it's a, a, a variation of that. But if you look below, it's primarily a generic ISM band radio operating at these frequencies. Now, uh, to give a view with, in terms of this modulation technique, so it will be supposed to be low range, low power, and it will be using a chip spread spectrum, which is essentially trades off data rate for sensitivity in a fixed channel bandwidth. So here is uh, a representation. Um, the LoRa would be somewhere in the middle, where in, uh, in the bottom we have a low bandwidth, but could have a very long range as compared to the other wireless technologies. Okay, I'm sorry. So now for this, um, you can see one of the critical choices that they made in designing the LoRa system was really focusing on which frequency they're gonna use. So with this basic path cost equation, we can see that uh, as you go higher in frequency, you have 
bigger losses. So one approach is really to move down in frequency so that you could reach the distances that you need. So for this uh, LoRa implementation, the frequencies uh, that we have chosen or that uh, we are going to study or the LoRa has chosen is somewhere in the 900 megahertz ISM band, which has bandwidths of around 125 up to 500 kilohertz. And it has a maximum transmission power of 30 dBm. The range is targeted to be 10 kilometers and sensitivity of negative 137 uh, dBm. And these are the typical antenna gates for transmitters and the receiver. So with that, we can use, uh, we will be using this uh, uh, parameters to compute for the minimum amount of uh, signal that will be entering the low noise amplifier at the same time uh, the, the power that's needed to drive these transmitters. So as a system model, the, we will be only designing the front end and uh, the radio, the physical layer circuits. So we have the transmitter and the receiver chain. The idea is that this whole circuit is a 900 megahertz transceiver circuit that will be operating with a one volt supply and it's targeted to be implemented using a 65 nanometer uh, CMOS process. So here, uh, the input side transmitter is you have a spin trigger, some inverter chain and all the stages going to the antenna and from the receiver, it will have a low noise amplifier going to a balloon and a mixer. So this part here is something that we have not implemented, but it's being studied for the next research to do the, uh, the different modulation techniques for LoRa. So first part is we have this uh, Schmidt trigger, which essentially it's preserving the signal to signal frequency so, so that we can produce the uh, rail to rail voltage for the switching amplifier. Now for our case, this is implemented with a six transistor uh, Schmidt trigger. And the idea is that when you have a 900 megahertz, uh, 300 millivolt uh, peak to peak amplitude signal, the output will be the rail to rail voltage. Now from there, it passes through a, an inverter chain. So essentially we're just trying to increase the drive current with this inverter chain. And each inverter driver will drive a larger inverter unit until it can discharge a class to support the class D amplifier output stage. And finally we have this uh, amplifier's uh, output stage. And we are using power combiners to achieve this high voltage swing needed to output a one output from a one volt supply. So if you look at this, it's implemented with multiple transformers. It, it's composed of coils that are wound to each class D amplifiers as shown in this uh, figure here. And the secondary coils will be wound in serial and terminated in to a 550 ohm load. So that's the output stage. Now we go to the uh, input, uh, input stage, which is the low noise amplifier. So the idea is that this is implemented with a common source amplifier with inductive source degeneration. We'll be offering good isolation, uh, low to moderate noise, and it's, it should have good linearity. So we need this to have this, uh, need this to have the necessary required voltage gain for the initial stage. And then this will be fed to a balloon, which is used for differential signaling and it provides the phase difference and the gain of greater than zero. So we have chosen to have an active balloon. So this will occupy a smaller space and it's a CGCGS, a CS balloon configuration. And in this configuration, this provides the needed gain. And then for the mixer, this is an act, uh, Gilbert cell implementation. It is an active double balance mixer cell configuration. Well, it adds gain to the signal, sorry for that one, and removes even order this uh, distortion. So this is the output stage up to the mixer, and then this will be fed to the different stages after this one. So with that, uh, we perform some uh, simulations given this uh, specification that we have we should have a LNA gain of 40 dB, a bandwidth of around 20 megahertz for the, uh, uh, for the LNA, a balloon gain of uh, greater than zero dB, a mixture gain of 8 dB, and essentially we'll have this system conversion gain of 
45 dB, and these are the other um, requirements. So it should be operating in the 900 megahertz, and these are some of the um, local oscillator and, and intermediate frequency outputs. So as results, we have performed some uh, receiver front end simulation. So using that uh, model that we have presented of the loss, so we have said that the input to the LNA or the received signal should have uh, input peak to peak voltage of 15.67 microvolts. And then the output uh, peak to peak voltage would be 5. Point uh, 66 million volts, it will have this gain of 361 and the power gain of 51 dB and the power consumption of 2.63 uh, milliwatts. Now in terms of the transmitter, um, these are the results for the transmitter. So we have a calculated inverter fan out chain and then this column, uh, we have the optimized fan out for maximum V out and output voltage, power output, power consumption, and efficiency. Now, initially, we have performed simulations with inductor Q of having five, and with that, the result, it, it will have a power output of 21 uh, dBm, and a consum power consumption of 672 milliwatts, and with an efficiency of 21%. Uh, it's not that high, but as you improve the quality of the inductor that you use, so having higher quality inductors would increase the power efficiency. Of course, we have the theoretical limit wherein the inductor Q would be very, very high. Then you have a power efficiency of around 47%. Uh, so but that's the limit in terms of what you can get when you try to have the Q as high as possible. Now in terms of the receiver front end, so just to summarize, we have a 65 nanometer uh, circuit uh, to be operating at 900 megahertz. It's a supply of one volt. Uh, the gain is 51.15 uh, dB and an image rejection of 28 dB. Now in this, the power consumption is around 2.63 milliwatts. And then this is this simulation work is compared with actual uh, devices from Semtech, other researches from um, number two, and some uh, devices from Philips. So, in terms of the transmitter, uh, we have implemented, again, in 65 nanometer, uh, the topology will be a class D uh, amplifier. It will be having some power combiners. And essentially, its peak output power is around 23 dBm and a drain efficiency of 21%. Now, in comparison to other works implemented at different frequencies, uh, the efficiencies will be different, varying across the different uh, implementation technologies. So, in conclusion, we have uh, implemented a or designed a circuit to operate at 900 megahertz with a one volt supply, and it's supposed to be designed for. Uh, LoRa transceiver communication, but which is essentially a generic ISM band radio operating at around 900 megahertz. Uh, for the receiver front end, we have this 51 dB gain, this power consumption and image rejection of 28 dB. And on the transmit side, to be transmitting uh, 21 dBm per out of power, and it has an efficiency of 21 to 36% efficiency. So that will be all for this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will be answering some questions. There are some. Are there questions from the audience? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, so good afternoon everybody. I am Paul Jason Koch uh, and I am presenting uh, our paper entitled Indoor Channel Modeling Using Ray Tracing as uh, part of the Don Felipe Say and Teresa Chua Say Professorial Chair Award. Okay, so uh, if you take a look at the title of this paper, there might be a lot of terms that are unfamiliar. Now, before we go into detail on what these uh, terms mean or their significance is, uh, basically, uh, this work is basically on wireless communications. Okay? So, wireless communications is a part of our daily lives. All of us use it. We use it when we use our mobile, mobile phones, when we connect our laptops to Wi-Fi, when we use our uh, smart wearable devices to connect to our phones. Uh, basically, it's everywhere, okay? Uh, in some form or another, you are using wireless communications, okay? Now, the main objective of wireless communications is basically to be able to exchange uh, information from one place to another wirelessly, okay? Now, uh, one of the most important aspects of wireless communication is, is something that is usually uh, not noticeable or you wouldn't really think about it and that is the wireless channel okay so for uh, any communication system okay uh, we basically have a source of information and we have an intended destination for that information okay and where that information travels is what we call the channel okay so it doesn't matter if it's a wired communication system or a wireless communication system uh, it, you can always uh, describe that system in terms of these three blocks. Okay? Now, uh, for wireless systems, our channel is wireless. Basically, it's free space. It is air. Okay? Now, uh, this wireless channel provides some challenges that are very unique to these wireless systems, okay? which basically are not present for, let's say, wired communication systems. Of course, uh, the wired channel also provides their own challenges, but for the most part, the challenges that they provide are uh, very predictable and can be compensated somewhat, uh, somewhat, somewhat can be controlled by the designers of the system, okay? Now, for wireless systems, basically the wireless channel is something that we have no control over, okay? It's there. Okay? So when you are designing your wireless systems, you can design or engineer your transmitter, different blocks of your transmitter, your receiver and the different components of your receiver, your antennas, but you cannot engineer the wireless channel. You're basically left to deal with it as it is. Okay? So what basically makes up our wireless channel? Okay? So the wireless channel is basically where the wireless signal travels. So for example, in this room, you can think of it as the air in the room. That's where the uh, wireless signal travels, okay? Now, in, uh, an ID, in the ideal case, or the ideal model for the channel is where it basically we have line of sight, where in the transmitter, there's a direct path between the transmitter and the receiver, and the only thing that you need to account for is the free space path loss, or basically the reduction of the power of the wireless signal as it travels from the transmitter to the receiver, okay? But that is not the case for most practical wireless systems, okay? So for example, if I'm a transmitter and my receiver is over there, yes, there is a line of sight, but that is the, not the only effect that the channel introduces to our communication link, okay? So the chairs, the walls, the roof, uh, the tables, everything that is present in uh, the environment of our wireless system actually plays a role in the signal that arrives at the intended destination, okay? Now, th these physical interactions of the wireless signal uh, can be categorized as, of course, the path loss, that is where uh, the energy becomes uh, smaller as it travels farther. Reflection, basically, is when the wireless signal bounces of uh, objects in the environment, diffraction, where basically the wireless signal bends in the corners, 
and absorption, where basically uh, elements of the environment absorb the energy that was transmitted. Okay? Now, why do we need to model the wireless channel? Okay? So it helps us understand what happens to the signal as it passes through the channel. Okay? And with that understanding, it allows system designers to predict how wireless systems will perform in their intended environments. Okay? And it ensures that wireless systems will work properly in these intended environments. So the only reason why your wireless devices work is because they were engineered to work uh, in these intended environments. Okay? Now, how do we model the channel? Okay? So one way of modeling the wireless channel is by using ray tracing. Okay? So ray tracing is an intuitive method for modeling the wireless uh, channel wherein the radio waves, which basically carry the information in our system, are <coughs> modeled as rays that are being launched from our transmitter. So as illustrated here in our figure. So we have a transmitter that is launching waves into the environment, into the uh, wireless channel. Okay? And these rays interact with the environment through reflection, diffraction, absorption, whatever, before it actually arrives at the receiver. Okay? So a lot of things actually happen uh, to our wireless signal before it arrives at the intended receiver. Okay? And we, with ray tracing, it's intuitive in the sense that we can visualize how the environment or the signal, the wireless signal interacts uh, with the propagation environment or our wireless environment. Okay, so uh, for ray tracing, some important components of ray tracing is the determination of the paths. So technically, there are an infinite number of possible paths that our wireless signal may traverse before it arrives at uh, the intended receiver. Okay, so it's a very complicated process, and one of the popular methods of trying to describe or determine which of these paths are valid is the method of images. So this is basically similar to, if you will recall your uh, electromagnetics, wherein you have a charge and an infinite ground plane. To find the field, you remove the ground plane and you place a mirror image of that charge. So it's very similar to that. The idea is the same. Okay? To be able to determine the paths that will be generated. Okay? by our uh, transmitter or the environment, okay? So aside from determining the paths, we also need to be able to model the interaction of these paths with the environment, okay? So let's say, for example, for path one, uh, as it traverses uh, in this path, then the wireless signal will be attenuated due to free space path loss, okay? When it arrives at, let's say, this, this wall boundary, there will be reflection, so there will be an effect on the amplitude of the signal, of the reflected signal, as well as the phase of the reflected signal. And then it will again travel along this path until it reaches the receiver. Okay? So the effect of that length of the path that the signal travels, as well as its reflections or diffractions, uh, its interactions with the environment, will affect the final signal that actually arrives at our receiver. Okay, so how do we model these interactions? Okay, so for this work, uh, we basically use the free space path loss model to model the uh, waves as it travels in air. Okay? And then for reflections, we use the, these equations here. Okay? So this is for the transverse electric and for the transverse magnetic polarization of the uh, incident waves to, let's say, the walls or the surfaces that are in the environment. And finally, we have diffraction. So this is based on the uniform theory of diffraction. Okay? So, so how do we visualize this? Okay? So I've shown some simple figures. I've shown some equations. So what does this thing actually look like? Okay? So, what we did here was we modeled room 420 here in triple E. Okay? So that is shown in the figure here. Okay? So uh, 
the students who work on this painstaking try to model the dimensions of room 420 and uh, imported it into MATLAB. Okay? They made a method of image algorithm basically to be able to determine the different paths that the, 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 the wireless signal will traverse before arriving at the receiver. Okay? So, uh, at least for this work, we limited the reflections to third order reflections, meaning that the signal can only bounce three times before arriving at the receiver, and we only model first order diffractions. So this is basically to reduce the comp computational complexity of the, the ray tracing algorithm. But theoretically, you can extend it to any number of reflections in diffractions, but of course at the expense of uh, much longer simulation times. Okay? And in general, higher than that, uh, the signals that actually arrive at the receivers are very, very small compared to the lower order interactions, so they have very minimal effect on the final outcome. Okay? So this model obviously takes into account the geometry of the room. It also takes into account the uh, electromagnetic properties of the different parts of the room, such as the whiteboard, the glass windows, the walls, ceilings, floor, wooden doors, and the cloth blinds. Okay? So, I think it's Okay? So, we also performed an experiment where it basically, uh, in room 420, where we basically, which we basically modeled and simulated using our ray tracing algorithm, uh, we performed experimental measurement. Uh, of the take note, we removed the tables and the desks since we did not want to include that in the model since if you include that, it would further increase the complexity of the simulation. Okay, So we made use of a vector network analyzer shown there at the bottom. Uh, Yagi Uda antenna for the receiver, which is a directional antenna, and a PIFA antenna for the transmitter, which is an omni directional antenna. Okay, so it, the idea here is that we use an omnidirectional antenna for the transmitter to be able to excite as many paths as possible in the room. Okay? Many spatial directions. Okay? And we use a directional antenna for the receiver so that we're able to filter spatially or point in which, which direction we want to measure. So we're basically uh, filtering the paths so if we pointed it that way, in this direction, we're effectively just measuring the path, that the, uh, the waves that are coming from that direction, thereby isolating the paths. Okay? Of course, it's not perfect. There are some uh, other effects that, need to, that weren't taken into account, but it's a uh, close enough approximation. Okay? So here are the results. So they, these are the received power for the valid paths that were performed in simulation and validated using uh, experimental. Okay? So for the most part, we have fairly good agreement between the simulation and experimental results, although of course there are some errors in some certain paths, uh, but this might be attributed to some of the assumptions that were made in the simulations as well as the physical limitations in the experimental setup, okay? So, in summary, okay, uh, we, an uh, image method for determining the valid paths in an indoor environment were developed. Uh, interactions of the propagating radio waves in an indoor environment were modeled with reflections up to third order reflections and first order diffractions and simulation results were compared with experimental results. Okay, so thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge uh, the donor of my professorial chair award, Dr. Nikise and Teresa Chinese. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. We have one question from the audience. Yes. Uh, when it was Uh, I think there was, I don't remember the exact uh, value, at least the average 
maybe around 10 dB average variation between the simulated and uh, simulated and experimental results. But of course, uh, there are a lot of things in the experimental setup that were not taken into account uh, by the simulations, but it's a good enough predictor to how the waves interact in that specific environment. Any questions from our audience? Okay, thank you very much. While well, Dr. Leon is setting up, may we ask everyone if you were able to sign the certificate of birthday? Before pala magsimula, yun dun sa mga 190 na napilita mo maten dito, please see me after. Okay, mag-check ng attendance for 180. Alright. Okay, good afternoon. So, I'm here to present um, our work entitled Effects of Changing Material Properties on Vibration Modes of Guitar. So, uh, this was pre presented um, in the IEEE International Conference on Control System Computing and Engineering um, last year. So, let's move on to the motivation of this work. Who among you can play the guitar? Or who have played the guitar? One, two, three, four. Who among you studied guitar? Talaga nag take ng lessons. There's one, okay. So, guitar is of course one of the most popular instruments in the world simply because it's easy to play and it's very much um, accessible to everyone. And if you are serious in, in using the guitar, um, most likely, you, you need to enroll in a class and, and buy a guitar. Now, unfortunately, um, Philippine-made guitars are not, are not really up to standard. So, karaniwan na nabibili, um, if, if compared with, with important ones, hindi ganun kaganda yung tunog. Now, um, why is this? Bakit sub-quality or sub par yung, yung Philippine guitars? Number one, um, it's because of manufacturing inconsistencies. There's no particular standard for us on how to, to make the guitar or probably the environment where they are made, they are not controlled, like the one shown in the picture. Because usually, um, guitar making the field is just a backyard business. Lang siya, okay? It's not a large scale business. Also, Philippine-made guitars uh, are said to, to be, uh, to have poor playability. Hindi siya kasi comfortable as compared to uh, the imported and more, more expensive ones. And finally, um, in terms of acoustics or in terms of sound quality, inferior din siya. And bakit siya ganun? It's because of the wood quality used, okay? So most probably, the backyard uh, manufacturer would just use cheap um, wood, palo china, even plywood, or some other materials that are really appropriate for making uh, such guitar. So how does the choice of wood actually affect the tonal quality? So before I discuss that, um, let me just briefly describe um, how the sound of the, the, the guitar uh, is produced. So naturally, you need to uh, pluck or strum the guitar, which would then produce certain vibrations. And with their vibration, um, it would uh, generate some energy. 
but only 5 to 7% of that string vibration are actually converted to sound. Why? Because it's manipis yung string. So there's nothing much inter interaction between the string and, and uh, uh, the channel or the air. So what is happening? That energy, that sound energy, must be um, amplified. Kaya siya nakakabit sa soundboard ng isang guitar. So, dito, dito nakakabit. So, the, the, the acoustic energy is transferred to the, the soundboard of the guitar through the bridge of your guitar. So, that means that, ah, okay, in order for my guitar to be um, a good amplifier, kailangan nagbabibrate din siya in harmony with the string. Which leads us to, ah, okay, when choosing the material for the soundboard, kailangan pala carefully selected din siya. So shown here are the different parts of the guitar as well as the usual um, choice of woods. Okay. Kung mapapasin yung well, important kasi to, so yung, yung dinidescribe na ng kahoy, hindi ganun ka familiar sa atin. Like for example, um, sa taas, sa uh, head and ear, we have ebony, rose, wood, or sa neck, we have, well, mahogany is also available to us. Um, almost all parts of the guitar use what we call hardwood, yung matikas talaga, except for the top of the top plate of the soundboard, which use spruce, um, cypress, cedar, and, and uh, redwood. So yung ginagamit na, na material is for the top of the soundboard, is, is usually made of, of uh, what we call a, a soft wood, so mas malungo siya kumpara sa, sa ibang. Okay. Now, when described by musicians, why do you use spruce? Um, pag dinescribe nila yan, sasabihin nila, well, um, this kind of guitar produce um, crisp, crisp high, or big bottom, it's very malaki yung um, nagbibigay ng soundboard. Pag pinalita mo yung cedar, uh, bell-like quality, and so on. So, depending sa kaway ng naginagamit, nag nag-iba yung quality ng sound, or nag-iba ng color. So, how can the choice of wood on the soundboard be characterized quantitatively. So yun naman yung gusto namin pasinin. We have to look at the different vibration modes of, of the, the soundboard of the guitar. The guitar soundboard vibrates at certain frequencies. And these frequencies are called the eigenfrequencies, which are the natural resonant frequencies of the soundboard. And the corresponding deformed shape, the main shape niya, is called the eigenmode. Yung pinaka-importante are usually below 500 hertz. So for example, um, we have different vibration modes. Ang assumption dito, without traces. And all are labeled in the form of quantity Mn, which denotes the nth harmonic in the longitudinal and nth in the lateral direction. So if it's um, zero, 00, it means monopole. Then it produces this one, magiti animation it produces the greatest displacement of air, which produces the, the base of, of, the, of the radiation. If you consider the, the other vibration modes, for example, one zero, so may natin yung displacement of the soundboard with respect to the top plate, um, the displacement of the air, um, hindi kasing laki as compared when it was uh, monopole. Okay, so usually, yung monopole, that primarily dictates the, the voice of, of your guitar. So these are for low and medium frequencies, uh, which primarily dictate the voice of, of, of your guitar. For other modes, for example, the zero one mode, or the long dipole, and the one one mode, or the quadrupole, um, you would notice that although uh, the boards are, are, have their own eigenmodes, there's not much displacement with respect to the air. So, ibig sabihin, wala silang masyadong um, contribution. However, the overall combination of these different icon modes gives the overall tonal quality of your guitar. Hence, uh, proper selection of wood for your guitar is very, very important. So, if the vibration modes are affected by the wood properties, can the vibration modes be predicted? And that's the goal of the study, um, which is to determine the effects of varying material properties on guitar vibration modes. So hopefully this would help the uh, Philippine uh, guitar makers or luthiers in 
properly choosing um, which wood uh, to use for their, their um, some board. So different material properties uh, for the wood were considered like density, which is the ratio of the open dry weight of wood um, to its volume at its current moisture content. Also the um, Poisson ratio, which is just the um, amount of transversal expansion divided by the amount of um, axial compression. The Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity, which describes the um, tensile elasticity or the tendency of an object to deform along an axis. And finally, the modulus of rigidity or shear, um, shear modulus, which describes an object's tendency to shear when acted upon by opposing forces. So notice that the range of frequencies, you, the, the range of values used for each material property um, were carefully selected to represent a wide uh, array of woods. So they can represent different types of woods. So for the methodology, primarily simulation was done using finite element method. Um, of course, you have to indicate the geometry of your guitar. Um, in this case, since this is part of a larger funded project, um, we used uh, the, the, the measured, uh, the standard measurement for that, for that study. And then material data um, was then inputted and varied, and then eigenfrequency simulation were performed. And after that, you just sweep the, the um, parameter. So for each range of value in the material data, um, 13 points were um, selected. Okay. So back at finite element method, this is the most appropriate method for this type of study because uh, it is a form of discretization of uh, a continuum into a large but finite number of non-overlapping elements connected at their nodes. So maybe parang gagawa ng kulambo which shapes, which approximately has the same shape of your um, target um, object. For the simulation setting, um, maganda kasi iba-iba yung size ng, ng tetrahedral. So the maximum size is around 7.6 inches para sa mga hindi importante parts. And the minimum size is 0.005 inches. That's the most important thing. Um, model analysis was used to determine the eigenfrequency. And usually for guitar, it is the first 10 eigenfrequencies that are important. So yun lang naman kailangan i-determine. Now, as an extension, aside from determining uh, the eigenmodes and the eigenfrequencies, we also want to determine the uh, the frequency uh, spectrum or the response the response of of the resulting guitar sound if we are to place a probe at the an important point of of your guitar. So in this case, we place a probe on the bridge of your guitar. So in this case. Um, the frequency is limited between 130 and 500 hertz with a uh, resolution of 1 hertz. And the RMS displacement was calculated. And what, when that was collected, then um, FFT uh, was applied. Um, other assumption is that the boundaries were fixed for the both sides, for so the back plate and the top plate, including the bridge, are free to vibrate. And we set the initial displacement or initial condition to zero. In comparing what we have done with other studies, um, in this case, uh, the model has around 200,000 tetrahedral elements. Comparing that to the next study or other literature, yung pinakamalapit is just around 20,000. So this is much, much more complex and comprehensive as compared to, to other studies. All right, so for the vibration modes, um, ito yung nakolekta namin. Um, basically, we are more concerned with the vibration modes of the top, top plate, which are given by figures 1, 3, 6, 7, 9, and 10. Yung back, hindi naman okay lang. Kasi usually stiff naman yung back, so wala kami masyadong pakailan doon. And in this case, each mode... Uh, occurs at specific frequency, which is within 100 hertz to, to 500 hertz. So you need a silly sweet moment. So, so for example, of a frequency response, let's say we vary the density. Okay, so this is the frequency response. X-axis is frequency, Y-axis is uh, magnitude. 
Um, the blue plot represents the frequency spectrum when the density is around 400 kilograms per um, meters cube. And yung red dash line represents um, when we increase the density to around 500 uh, kilograms per volume. Um, of course, we notice that when we increase the volume, there's a shift to the left with respect to the frequency response. Now, why is this so? Well, if we have a more dense material, it becomes heavier. We assume that we are working with the same volume. Hence, you have more dense material, same volume, it would resonate at a lower frequency. So this shift in resonance would then matter if it is coupled with how um, the action of the guitar couples with the notes that are being played by, by the guitarist. So as we sweep the density and observe the relationship between the shift in mode frequencies with respect to each mode, we find that um, more dense materials are harder to, to, to resonate at higher frequencies and that um, there's more effect on the higher modes as compared to the lower modes. For example, this one, uh, modes 9 and 10, has around negative 0.25, while for the mode 1 and 3, it's just negative 0.1, which is much less than compared to the higher modes. But in general, um, it is observed that the intensity has an inverse relationship with respect to um, the movement of the modes. Similarly, let's say if we replace uh, the modulus of elasticity, let's say the blue plot represents 7 gigapascals, where as the red dash line represents 12.8 gigapascals, so an increase of, of uh, the modulus of elasticity. So mas mataas si Bali, it means na mas stiff yung, yung material natin. Um, it, observe, it is observed that increasing the, the modulus of elasticity um, shifts the frequency response to the right naman, okay? unlike, the, unlike the density. In this case, the shift is around 30 hertz, which is more significant as compared to the density. Now, if, why is this so? Um, the logical explanation is that stiffer material, kung mas stiff siya, then it should resonate at high frequency. So, yun naman yung um, um, effect ng pagpalit ng modulus of elasticity. So this is confirmed by tabulating a summary of the shift in mode frequencies. And similar to what was observed earlier, mas apektado yung higher modes as compared to uh, the earlier modes. If we change uh, the modulus of rigidity, no resistance to shear forces, um, wala masyadong effect. Okay? In fact, if we increase um, MOR from 431 to 617 megapascal, it just shifts to the right by 100, 1 hertz. So, walang masyadong effect yung, yung, yung property nito with respect to uh, the frequency response of, of the material. So, this is also validated here in the summary of the dependency of the mode frequencies with respect to changing modulus of uh, rigidity. And finally, with respect to Poisson's ratio, well, the Poisson's ratio is dependent on the modulus of elasticity and rigidity, the dependent variable siya. What was observed earlier should also be true for the modulus, for the, for the Poisson's ratio. And in this case, when we shift from 0.1 to 0 0.7, uh, the whole um, spectrum shifts to the right, may decrease siya ng by uh, 2 hertz in the lower range of frequencies and around 7 hertz. So, mas malaki yung effect niya with respect to the higher frequencies. So, ganun din, to summarize, um, mas malaki yung effect ng pag-move ng frequencies in the higher in the high region of, of frequencies and modes as compared to uh, the lower frequencies. So just to conclude, um, FEM simulations were successfully done to determine the guitar vibration modes and frequency responses, and it is the most comprehensive to date sa, sa literature. Um, we validated that the density is inversely proportional to the shift in the frequency response and mode frequencies, while the Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity, shear modulus or modulus of rigidity, and Poisson's ratio are directly proportional to the shift in 
uh, frequency response. Um, also, high frequency modes are affected, more affected in terms of the frequency shift in the modes by the parameter changes as indicated by larger slopes. So all our results agree with other um, studies. Um, however, mas 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 nagawa namin comprehensive yung summit, and also we also take into consideration yung frequency response, which would then enable us to actually synthesize the uh, a guitar sound, which weren't done by um, other studies. Um, just siguro lang as a word of caution um, in interpreting the result. Um, while they are useful, we also realistically we also have to incorporate the bracing. Kasi malaki ang epekto niya sa actual guitar sound. So pag nilagay ng mga patigas sa likod and support, um, magbabago na naman yung resonant frequencies. But the vision goal namin, which is to validate the effect of the material properties, uh, nagawa naman namin, uh, naman namin siya. Um, also, ang pabing utility nito, um, if, you don't, if, you, if you don't want to use wood, other makers actually use composite materials. Um, so, ang problema kasi sa wood, it is very much dependent on uh, the, the climate and the, the environment. And over time, nagmamature yung wood, nababawasan ng moisture content, it changes. So, nagbabago yung behavior ng wood. Unlike kapag composite material or synthetic, mas sigurado na hindi siya magbabago. So, if you want a more consistent but probably less environmental friendly guitar, you would use composite uh, material. Okay? So that's the end of this presentation. I'd like to acknowledge the guitar and the one team, which sila na may nagpasimula ng study nito. So we have different researchers from the College of Music um, and uh, Mechanical Engineering as well. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open to some of your questions. Questions. Thank you. Hi, it's Sir Mark. Yes, Sir Mark. Composite. Ano composite na ginamit nila? Meron composite sa soundboard mismo. Oo, naglaminate sila. And hindi wood yung ginamit nila. So, materials, merong material engineers na kumuha ng certain properties, merong target properties ng wood, inapproximate nila using synthetic materials. Ah, pero ito ay experimental. Experimental siya. Ano kaya lang production na I don't think may gumagawa ng production because for serious guitar players, nagmamatter yung aesthetic, yung wood grain, yung okay. feel. So kung gusto mo lang quality, pakinggan, siguro for recording purposes, pwede siya. Pero kung performance or concert, hindi siya over. Not unless may magandang, sobrang gandang lamini. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So kunyari, given alam mo na yung magandang property yes. yung soundboard. Meron pang right of the bat, pwede mo sabihin, pagkakita mo pa lang yung soundboard by measurement or simulation, ang ah, pangit yung tunog yan. Pwede na ba? Yan. Ulit, pag nakuha mo na yung target na... Kung nakakita ka ng wood or material uh, na may gantong property, kahit uh, hindi mo nagawin yung gitara, uh, alam mo na agad pangit yung tunog. Simula pa lang. Di ba ang ginagawa? Merong top tone test. Kinakatok nila. Tapos base sa katok, hindi kailangan pa rin pakinggan eh. Uh, may feel na sila kung that would work or not. So meron? Ah, okay. Uh, meron Pero, yung sorry, yun, 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 by model. Yun. Uh, sorry, yes. Ang ginawa nyo dapat kasi nasisynthesize nyo yung sound. Dapat. <laughs> Tapos yung pangat ko, pangat ko na isip, wala lang sa lang nagdito. Sige lang. So alam mo yung magandang property ng soundboard, no? Yes. Baka pwede natin i-3D print yun. <laughs> Papunta tayo. Kasi Lord. imagine sa Mars ka pupunta, walang wood eh. Yes. Pero gagawa ka ng gitara, gusto mo ma-reproduce yung sound sa Mars. <laughs> um, tapos magagawin mo lang yung feel ratio ng wood, tapos ng board, um, tapos it would mimic the sound. Of pwede, the tapos resistant nga siya sa kung ano ng environment. Magandang research na sali mo ako pag pinupo. Sa space, so, kailangan yung test natin siya sa space. Iba pa yung gagawin mo na. Sige, try mo na natin mag-synthesize. Pretty print ng guitar. Pretty print. Hindi iba-iba feel ratio para makuha yung magandang property, di ba? Hindi yun yung warm feel density. Okay, yun lang. Proposed time. Okay, yun lang po.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much.